Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Brovkin and Contemporary Issues with Dr. Brovkin. I know, my dear subscribers, that you all want me to comment on Prigozhin's uh, sudden death, but I think that those people who claim that they have an answer with one day uh, of the tragedy, were in fact don't have any answers. So I will pause on this until there is more evidence and then I promise I will have a video on Prigozhin, especially since the last one in the series was about his rebellion. But now I'd like to speak about some very important historical event and I like to think to take a bird's view, a historical uh, event, historical perspective on what's going on and that is the expansion of BRICS. So uh, BRICS is an organization that just included six new members in addition to the original five. So the original five were uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Uh, what it was originally was not a big deal. It was a kind of a partnership where each of the countries represented was in fact a member of some other uh, economic bloc or economic organization such as China was in Shanghai organization, Russia was in the European uh, Eurasian partnership program with uh, its neighbors, former Soviet republics uh, and uh, South Africa is a member of a regional cooperation organization etc. So what it actually was, uh, was just a partnership of countries that felt that they could be trading with each other uh, on better terms. But that's not what it has become now, and especially with the expansion of six new members. But before we go into the specific discussion of what was decided, why are these countries included, and what do they want, and why it is happening, and what exactly it means for Russia and for the United States, I'd like to take a kind of a historical perspective. And that is, in the 1990s, my former colleague at Harvard University, Samuel Huntington, published a fantastic book, which is called The Clash of Civilizations. And in that book, he identified five civilizations, the Western, and as he put it, that's his phrase, the West and the rest. Now, the rest included actually in his uh, typology, Cynic civilization, which is China, Indian civilization, which is India, um, then uh, traditional civilization, which was Africa and partly South America, and, and then he all, uh, and of course, Islamic civilization uh, as the core civilization, but also he defined Russia as a civilization which is an offshoot from the Western civilization, but not really uh, a Western civilization. So, and, and in a sense, he predicted the war between uh, East and West Ukraine, which is amazing. 20 years ago, he predicted it, but that's a separate topic. Uh, and uh, so what's int interesting is that of the non-Western four civilizations, three were represented in the original uh, founding members, India, China, uh, offshoot of the West, Russia, and the traditional one, South Africa. So from, from the very beginning, this alliance was basically a partnership of the rest, which is non-Western key civilizations. Now, what is a civilization? How different is just from a country or some, uh, what are these defined or nation? Civilization basically is something that is defined by culture, religion, most importantly, mentality, ways of doing things, perceptions uh, as different, distinct, and not wanting to be like the others. So in that sense, uh, each of those uh, four uh, and th three particularly, uh, Cynic, Indian, uh, Islamic, and the fourth traditional, meaning Russia as an offshoot of Western and African, are the ones that are represented there. Now, Huntington also coined the phrase which is indigenization. He has all kinds of statistics how the use of Western languages is decre decreasing, the, the, the GDP of the West is decreasing, and so forth and so on. Uh, and, and that is what is uh, 20 years later, this is what happened. So what happened today in Johannesburg is a declaration of the rest of independence from the West. 
uh, something that Huntington described, foresaw, and something that happened. Now, obvious question, of course, why do they want independence? Why don't they want to live in the so-called rules-based order, which was created by the United States, by Bretton Woods, when dollar was set up as an international currency with World Bank, IMF, all these things that were functioning quite well uh, from the point of view of the Americans in the um, 90s and, and, and the in the teens and the tens and so forth what's wrong why did these countries decide to create something new and something different well the answer actually lies very simply in the actions of the united states it could it could quite conceivable could be that if the united states took the kind of a, a wise approach not to dictate what it wants to everybody all the time, then perhaps the dollar would have continued and the rules-based order would have continued and so forth. But here we have a situation that Venezuela, for, that, that the United States doesn't like uh, because they're leftists and because they like Putin and whatever other reasons, uh, it, it had its money in the London banks and the United States and the British decided to just seize that money. Now, what kind of message is that to the rest of the world? Now, that, the message is, if we don't like what you do, we're going to seize your money. So money is politicized. It's no longer just dollars. No, it's no longer just dollars that you can have in any bank and have it safe. No, it's U.S. currency, which somebody can seize. Now, it, of course, the same goes about Cuba that is ostracized and, and there's an embargo for decades because the United States doesn't like Fidel Castro. OK, they don't like the communists. OK, fine. But that is another message. And then, of course, the biggest event was Russia. Russia has a conflict over borders with a neighboring state. And there are many, there are dozens of countries that have territorial disputes with neighboring states. Now, what the United States did, they seized 300 billion of Russian money uh, in froze them and can't find a, and are trying to invent ways, legal ways of trying to appropriate, expropriate, steal that money and give it to whoever they want, which is in this case, Ukraine. Now, the message, of course, to all these other countries is, ah, if they don't like me or my leadership or my policy, they could just take my money and uh, rob me steal it. The, the obvious result is let's create some other currency where we will be safe and nobody isn't going to dictate to us, ah, we're going to punish you if you sell such and such a product to Russia or if you sell such and such a product to Iran. Obviously, uh, th these are all countries that have a dispute of one part Thought, sort or another with the United States or rather the United States is trying to dictate to China what it should do with its rebellious province to Russia what it should do about Donbass to Iran I don't know what they're trying to dictate to they just don't like that government because there was a revolution that overthrew the Shah that was a stooge of the CIA in Iran so all these countries are trying to create a new currency that's the point the rest has rebelled against the west because the west was dictating to them what they should be doing so in that sense what BRICS is is an alliance of discontented of the rest those countries that don't like the west to dictate to them policies uh, and priorities in their development. In that sense, the conclusion is the key reason is the U.S. policy. If the United States had continued to be benign with the aspirations of these countries, the rules that they established with the IMF and World Bank and the dollar would have continued, but they don't, didn't. Their, their pride, their vanity pushed them to dictate to the U.S., to, to Russia, what to do to China, what to do to Iran, what to do Venezuela, etc., etc. Now, uh, so uh, the expansion of BRICS uh, is an important phenomenon and it needs to be explained why 
these countries do want to join. It is not only de-dollarization, which I already explained, but it, it also is a creation of what Putin uh, calls multi-centered order. Now, the United States has created a single-centered order in the world after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and, and all these former Soviet uh, satellites flock to the United States and flock to NATO, and now you have uh, you know, US plus United Europe, uh, and, and on the other side, the rest. And the rest are now in a new uh, partnership organization, economic partnership of BRICS. Now, the new countries, there are six, they chose to include six countries, and they're quite interesting uh, to look at them in terms of geopolitics and in terms of culture. Now, the most important, of course, uh, is the inclusion of three uh, major, four major uh, Islamic countries. It is Egypt, the most populous country uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it is Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that are a source of energy and money and investment and know-how. And it is also the inclusion of Iran. Now, that is absolutely fundamental. That is also a declaration that the feud between Iran and uh, China, excuse me, between Iran and Saudi Arabia is over uh, because of Chinese uh, interference and the good offices of reconciliation. So uh, Islamic civilization gets a huge representation in the new expanded BRICS. Moreover, it is it is so absolutely domineering that the countries that are the Islamic countries that are not there uh, uh, don't really count for much. Uh, and the next one uh, that is in line to be included, of course, is another heavyweight in the Islamic work, uh, world, which is uh, Indonesia with 200 million people. Uh, so that's the Islamic factor, extremely important. Now, Egypt also happens to be in Africa, and it's part of the Middle East, but part of North Africa. And at the same time, you know, the presence of Egypt and Ethiopia, which are uh, North Africa and, and Eastern Africa, uh, and uh, of course, South Africa, create a powerful magnet for many African countries that have already expressed interest in BRICS, and that means in Chinese investment and in Russian military and in energy that is Saudi Arabia plus Russia. So uh, that is a kind of a powerful new market, a most dynamically growing market in the world, and that is uh, in Africa. Uh, and finally, um, Argentina. Argentina plus Brazil are the two most populous and most uh, important and economically powerful countries in what America used to, uh, used to call, or likes to call, backyard, which is not really any backyard anymore. Uh, it is now uh, a kind of a powerful block in um, bricks. Uh, another comparison could be to say that of the newly admitted members, Two are very important Christian countries, and that is uh, Argentina and Ethiopia. Both of them are um, Christian in different ways, but at the same time, uh, they expand a kind of a Christian component uh, in, uh, newly, uh, in newly created uh, bricks. Uh, now, uh, let me just finally say a few words what this means for, the, for Russia and what this means for the United States, this truly historic event. Now, uh, basically, uh, BRICS, uh, as it is already today, uh, has become a, a much more powerful economic block than it was. Uh, the statistics vary. According to Putin, it is 40% of the world GDP. Uh, according to official data that I've heard, uh, it is 33% of the world GDP compared to compared to 30%, uh, which would be United States plus uh, seven G7 countries, which actually includes Japan. But if you talk just about the Western civilization and minus Japan, that's that's about 20 something percent as opposed to 30 something percent, which means already today, old BRICS, 
not counting six new members, is a more powerful economically organization than Western-led G7, which is U.S. and its closest Western civilization allies. Now, that means that uh, the future is not going to be dictated by the United States. Now, what it means for Russia, of course, is that there is no such thing as strategic defeat. Russia is emerging as one of the leaders of the uh, non-aligned movement, uh, one of the leaders of non-Western centers of gravity, or what Putin calls a uh, multi-centered world. Uh, very briefly, the, the, the economic impact is tremendous. Uh, for example, there is going to be a new railroad built from Russia to the Indian Ocean through Iran, and that gives trade access to uh, India and to pipelines to India and to Africa. It all ties in very well together with new Eurasian routes that China is building all over the place uh, in various parts and ports of uh, Eurasia and Pakistan and Iran and so forth. Uh, and of course, it also means that the United States is losing it. Now, let's just face it. This is why it's such an important historical event. Uh, it is historic because years later, uh, historians would say, yes, it is in 2023 that for the first time in 500 years, the rest, which is the West, non-West, the non-Western civilizations have become more powerful and economically more dynamic than a Western world. Uh, it also means that something that started in the 1500s with the preponderance of the West over the rest has, is coming to an end. Now, the rebellious rest, which means the Orient, the, the, the Islamic world, the Far East, the Chinese and the Indians and Muslims and uh, Africans, and even offshoot of the Western world, the Latin America civilization, and of course, Russia, are uh, creating their own multi-centered world, which is not going to be dominated by either Europe or the United States. That's the significance. Thank you very much. And please continue to listen to my uh, reports. Uh, the next one probably will be on Prigozhin's uh, death. Uh, and there are other things that I will be doing regularly. Thank you.